Preston's so hot right now. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner, even when Jason interrupts. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants, especially Jason, and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions, especially Jason's Grand Lodge. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level, Jason, to interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable or on the Facebook event page for episode 191, William Preston. You know me, my name is not Jason, my name is John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. And I'll hand it off to Robert Johnson for his introduction. Hey guys, Robert Johnson, Waukegan Lodge, number 78, Waukegan, Illinois, current sitting secretary past master there and a uh, district deputy for uh, first Northeast Grand Lodge, Illinois. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Next up in the mobile Masonic command or the Masonic mystery machine. We have Mike Hambrecht, Mike, the intern. Good evening, uh, Mike, the intern here from uh, Triandria Lodge, number 780 in Rock Creek, Ohio. Uh, current junior steward and lodge education officer. And fresh out of lodge. Hold out the driveway. Yep. All right. We'll drive safe. Thanks. Next up, we have Juan Sepulveda. Juan, how you doing tonight? Doing very well, brother. Thank you. Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry podcast. Okay, thank you, Juan. And I think that's about it. So let me just keep going forward without introducing Jason Richards. Good uh, evening, everybody. My name is not Jonathan Ruark. I'm not a past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. And I do not have four children, all of whom are girls. <laughs> I am, however, Jason Richards. Pa or, <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Oh, I jumped the gun on that one. For my last week, uh, Worship <laughs> Master, <laughs> Lodge number 16, in Clifton, Virginia, this Saturday, I am getting deposed, and it's going to be glorious. Uh, also a member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in the District of Columbia. Isn't it like jinxable though? Like if you say past master before you're a past master, then like something wrong is going to happen. You're going to have to stick around for another year. So, so technically, as soon as you become master, you can technically get the title of past master. You don't necessarily have to finish out your term. I know Ro uh, Robert Johnson said in his jurisdiction, you are automatically a past master as soon as you're installed in the chair. Is that true? That is absolutely 100% correct. So you're installed as master. Uh, after that, you're always a PM. <clears throat> Unless you're Jason. <laughs> That's not how we roll in Virginia. Let's uh, go right to our sponsor tonight uh, for the fourth and final week. This week's episode is sponsored by Worshipful Brother Ryan J. Flynn, Masonic artist and patent designer. If you haven't seen those patents, they're pretty cool. Uh, he's based out of New Hampshire, and since 2010, Brother Flynn has been using a variety of mediums to capture beautiful Masonic architecture, people, medieval-style patents, um, Masonic buildings, and other Masonic works of art. Brother Ryan is available to do custom commission works for Masons and Masonic Lodges if you are interested in commissioning a piece with Brother Ryan, and I highly encourage it, uh, you to do so. Contact him at ryan at ryanjflynn.com with F-L-Y-N-N, -N, or visit his website at www.ryanjflynn.com. And he also created our patent for our 300 event last June, so uh, if you... Still have the link for the pictures, or if you want to take a look at that, we'll have that up on our website shortly-ish. So check that out. I'm expecting to have it available this weekend. So for the brothers that have been waiting since June uh, for the patent, uh, they will be available, uh, I want to say, by Friday night. So you'll, you'll see a post from us on our Facebook page about it. Awesome. I can't wait. I'm excited about it. I'm going to order like 10. And by 10, I mean like one. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff. Okay, let's uh, move into Masonic News this week. Um, 
it is December, which means we have closed on our No Shave November uh, fun drive, and it was a fun drive. We we were able to, as a team, uh, collect over twelve hundred dollars for the support of cancer research, uh, and uh, I think it's a really awesome thing that we were able to do that. It was a fun experiment, and we are still crunching the numbers to figure out um, who gets those grand prizes we talked about every week since then so stay tuned for next week as we call all the data and uh, reward those for contributing to a great cause somebody is going to get that apron and it's going to be absolutely amazing um and you can't get your apron before dave gives me mine just saying you can hold it hostage (laughs) <laughs> no 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 it's it's really exciting um we're we're very thankful for everybody who donated to this cause uh everybody who donated across um the the individuals on the tmr team uh we it was a great outpouring of support and one of the reasons why we're still crunching the numbers is we each have to go in individually and, and tally everything up uh to make sure that that we're uh, picking the the person who donated the most overall, as opposed to the person who you know simply donated the most to John, which I think is a terrible thing for anyone to do. Um, so you'll uh, tune in next week, and we will announce the the definitely the winner of the uh, Masonic apron. And uh, for those of you who donated twenty five dollars or more to me, I know there are about five of you who did. Um, stay stay tuned because I will be reaching out to you. Um, as best I can to get your information so I can send you your goodies. Yeah, and Brother Flanagan, hit me up. Thank you so much for your generosity. I have something uh, waiting for you, so find me in whichever way you can. (laughs) Facebook, email. Private Snapchat. Privately. (laughs) Off the record. Yeah, for for those of you who donated, just send us a message on the Facebook page, and we will uh, we'll get back to you. Yep. All right, we've talked about this for a few months now. It's been hyped up by the History Channel, who is actually going to air something historically relevant, and that specific thing related to masonry is Nightfall. On Star. It's not on Star. This is Nightfall, a series, mini series. I don't know. Uh, that will be, be premiering tomorrow, Wednesday, December 6th at 10, 9 central. Talking all about the Knight Templars. It seems to be well done as far as costumes and direction. And if it's anything like the trailers, then that should be a good time. So stay tuned to that. I know I'll be TiVoing it and we'll add that to our things to talk about next week. None of them are wearing Chippos or Class A's. What the hell? Yeah, uh, Nick's going to be really disappointed. You know, the, the funny thing is, though, anybody who's going to watch this, I mean, they really give these things the rock star treatment. Um, if you guys watched uh, Sons of Liberty, was totally amazing. Um, however, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Ben Franklin never said uh, bat stuff crazy. And, you know, uh, they really portrayed some of their guys uh, as these kind of young hunks when they were kind of like, fat middle-aged drunks so uh you know take it for the grain of salt yeah when they did the sons of liberty i was the that sounds really like like a nerd but i was really upset that they did put in the line the redcoats are coming when that was never said yeah i mean also sam adams was like so good looking i'd date him right uh when in actuality, you know, he's this 40 something year old, you know, drunkard who's all about, you know, class, uh, he's against like class warfare. You know, he's this middle, like, you know, middle ground guy for, for middle income families. And he sticks up for all of these, you know, these, uh, for lack of a better word, like, you know, programs for underprivileged folks who aren't making a living. And they turn him into, you know, like Johnny Depp and pirates. <laughs> but he makes a great oatmeal stout. I'll tell you what. Oh man. Yeah. You know, I, this came up the other day. We're going to, I'm a nerd on beer for a minute. Somebody was like, I don't ever even really drink beer. What should I get? And I said, you know, man, 
just order a Sam Adams. Like, it's never going to be bad. It's always just a good, solid choice. You can't. You not can't Boston not. Lager, though. Even the Boston Lager is just oh. fine. Oh. I feel. It's, it's, are you are you seriously drinking an oatmeal stout as well? That's amazing. Cheers, brother. Clink. <laughs> it's the Sam Adams. Yeah. Look at that. But. Next up. For Masonic News, we have something of interest to at least myself and probably no one else. Out of Chris Hodap's blog, we have a new announcement that the Grand Lodge of New York is organizing two, not one, but two new academic lodges. <clears throat> so what's an academic lodge? I don't know. There might be one in Fairfax, Virginia, <clears throat> the Patriot Lodge number 1957. There might be one in Washington, D.C. There might be several in Washington, D.C., actually. And so Colonial Lodge joining the fine institutions that we have here. We have two new ones from New York, uh, specifically one for Columbia University and another for the City University of New York. There's even a um, preliminary website that's been set up, Columbia Lodge 1754.org. And I'm really excited to see this moving along. Um, I know I personally have met a lot of these brothers who have been trying to, who are in different stages. And it's really, it's really a neat community. <clears throat> I know we've had um, Brother Scott Sherman talk about uh, the Boston University Lodge and the ac academic schema that we have. And it's really cool because it's like craft brewing. Let's talk, let's, let's tra trace it all back to beer. It's like the craft brewing community because they all like to help each other out and they'll share ideas and they'll, they'll cross pollinate, um, concepts and and regalia and that kind of stuff and so it's a fascinating subculture uh, of freemasonry and so it's super exciting to see new york uh carrying that forward so congrats uh to all the hard work that those brothers have done in not only um initiating two new lodges but specifically under the academic scheme it's super cool and that's what i've got for masonic news Let's get into tonight's topic, which is on the brother known as William Preston. If you haven't heard of Preston, you may have heard of the Preston Web ritual that is practiced throughout most of North America and other parts of England. And so tonight we're going to learn a little bit about who he was as we kick off Ritual Month with a, a series of ritual themed shows and uh, topics. So Diving right in, who was William Preston? Well, he was born in on the 7th of August in 1742 and died the 1st of April, 1818. Um, so what I like to do is try to put that in context of other Freemasons at the time. So if he was born in 1742, uh, George Washington um, got his Master Mason degree in 1752, 10 years later. So he's... Um, we don't believe they knew each other. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> Especially because uh, Preston was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and then later moved to London, where he, he dove into Freemasonry. I think it was interesting that, uh, that he tried to uh, create a lodge under the Grand Lodge of Scotland with a bunch of uh, Scottish transplants. Right, transplants. In, in London. Yeah, exactly. In London, and uh, after the Grand Lodge of Scotland... Uh, Denied him and politely suggested that he look at the Grand Lodge of England. He acquiesced and did so. And so if you remember, uh, about the time where he's 21, looking for a lodge to join, uh, he did join an ancient lodge. Ancient specifically meaning the modern ancient split, which is, which is going on at this time, uh, where there were two Grand Lodges um, going on. And remember, just as a reminder, the ancients were the newer ones. The moderns were the older ones. Why was that? Because um, the the fork, the spinoff group, um, was upset with a lot of the changes that were going on. And they said, you had changed so much, you had become modern. And so we want to get back to the way it was anciently. So the newer group. The ancients were the OG traditional observance movement. <laughs> there you go. Old school. Uh, so he, he joined the ancient lodge. And Immediately, he joined an ancient lodge in April 20th of 1763 when he was 21 years old. Shortly, you know, dove right in and found out he hated the ritual work. <laughs> um, 
And so shortly thereafter, <clears throat> switched membership to a different lodge in town. Pretty sure it was a different ancient lodge. Um, went back to his mother lodge and convinced all of his brothers to leave that lodge that he was in and go come over to this new lodge. And on top of all of that, got the modern Grand Lodge to come in and consecrate it <laughs> as a new lodge. <laughs> Literally switched from ancient to modern all within the first year and a half of being a Master Mason. <laughs> so this guy um, was very active in masonry from the get-go. And um, even then, quickly learned that the rituals that he had um, received both ancient and, and in, in the modern system were, you know, in, in his words, they were just basically stuck together. They, they weren't cohesive. They were very, they weren't treated very well. Uh, and he really couldn't understand the system that he had fallen into. <clears throat> so um, about uh, nine years later, He's, he's working to get some political clout. He's working to work under the Grand Secretary of the Moderns. Um, and he does that for about seven years. So he's really rubbing elbows, um, studying hard. He's diving in and says, you know, I think I can do better. I think I can help with these lectures. So what he does is he takes an effort to rewrite a lot of the lectures. So if you're going to do this, okay, let's, let's consider the political environment at the time. You're going up against a system what, while though it, it may have only been around since 1717 in an organized fashion, right? Then you had this modern ancient split. <clears throat> Masonry is still not that old at this point in time um, as far as a formalized institution. And, you know, you have these other grand lodges that are kind of vying for power. So if you're going to come in and start changing things up <clears throat> in, a, in a big way, you have to, one... Keep keep adherence to the landmarks of Freemasonry that we've talked about in the past. That you're 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 going to innovate, but within within the lanes, right? You're going to make sure that you're not violating any of those those ancient landmarks. You're going to adhere to a lot of what Anderson put in his constitutions, and um, you're going to build off of what um, was already out there. There was another <clears throat> brother who had uh, by the last name of Calcutt, who had put together a lot of the ritual work. But Calcutt really just kind of stuck together some things that were working in emulation ritual that were um, kind of modern um, uh, sermons of the day and, and some, some liberal translations of Anderson's Constitutions to stick together this kind of ritual book. It was a good start, and Preston built off of that to solidify where he was going. So if you're going to publish a, a new and improved, at least first lecture, and he was focused on, on the entered apprentice um, set of lectures first, you just don't like sneak this under the door of the grandmaster and like hope for the best, right? This dude went all out. In May 21st, 1772, invited the Grand Lodge to have this huge gala with uh, wine, which of course that helps, and toasts and and had you know a public oration of all of these different new lectures that he's come up with that you know really kind of rectify all the all the disjointedness of the past um so as a showman holy smokes this was the perfect way to do this right that you're he's just laying all his cards on the table but making sure that hey you know we're, i'm doing this for you let's celebrate let's have a big big party and that, that obviously won favor of all those who attended, including the Grand Lodge. So while it never really came out that it was explicitly authorized by the Grand Lodge, he certainly made a lot of friends that night. And in doing so, his first illustrations of masonry, um, his first lectures uh, codification, started becoming used and sold uh, as as ritual work and um, new new pamphlets that were given to newly initiated masons, so he's already starting to get a little bit of celebrity status at this point in time. Um, this is so when you're rising from nothing, you're a very active 
Mason. Remember, you're switching Grand Lodges within less than two years. You're rewriting lectures. Um, he's really making a name for himself. And uh, that, that wasn't without some controversy. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Robert or anyone else who's done some research on this, too, to find out where he may have rubbed some people the wrong way. So take it away. So, so dude was like a, uh, he was a real turd stirrer. <laughs> <laughs> As the, uh, uh, like, you know, touching on what you said, John, I mean, it takes some huge cojones to like basically throw your own big party for your lectures and then sell it. Right. I mean, uh, can we just do that today? So he's can basically like, right? let's yeah, let's, let's just, let's do that. Let's so write my own lectures. Yeah, we're just going to do that. We're going to rewrite them. We're going to host every Grand Lodge. We'll invite them. We'll pay out of pocket. It's going to be sweet. And then so are everybody we in the craft MJ will love now? it. What? Are we the NMJ now? <laughs> <laughs> we write our own lectures. <laughs> we're going to sell them to you. With submarines. Well, you, I mean, there's a bit of, I mean, like that's. Videos? That that kind of that, that kind of happened with uh, with Webb, right? That's that's what he that's why he rewrote stuff. Um, but we're talking about Preston. Uh, we're talking about Preston. So uh, his controversy is, is interesting in that um, basically December seventeen seventy seven. Uh, he and his buddies, his his masons, they're attending a church service. They're in regalia. Uh, this is when he's with a lodge called Lodge of Antiquity. Uh, and they're under the Grand Lodge. He, uh, they, they attend this church service, and then they basically walk across the street, as most texts say. I mean, it's very close. Uh, the illustrated, uh, Masonry Illustrated says that it was like across the street. Uh, Mason's words basically says it's akin to, you know, taking a crosswalk back to the, the tavern or pub or the lodge was and they didn't feel like they had to take off their masonic regalia because um it was right there and the lodge hadn't been closed yet uh so they go and some dudes basically report preston uh to uh to the grand lodge that he's having erect like an irregular practice by by being in public with his regalia on and uh basically they decide to expel him. Um, then later on, he writes this huge apology for doing what he did, and he said he's never going to, uh, to do this. Um, what I should also mention is that he argued, rather than just saying, like, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, we were crossing the street with, you know, uh, regalia on for, like, five minutes, sorry people saw us, what he did instead was say that his lodge was so old um, it is the Lodge of Antiquity. It wasn't beholden to the the laws of Grand Lodge. So, based on that kind of pompous attitude, they were like, nope, we'll show you, and they expelled him. So, dude then goes back to his lodge uh, after he writes this apology, and they, they, they let him back in. He goes back to his lodge, and he basically expels everybody who gave him a hard time and um i can't pronounce the guy's name it starts with an n how do you say that uh jason probably knows maybe um, the uh northhook yeah northhook so northhook is the yeah, big northhook. yeah this guy is the big like antagonist here and so uh preston he he kicks and expels uh, this guy out of his own lodge as well as several other members. Those members then go to Grand Lodge, tell on Preston, immediately reinstate uh, Northrop back to the lodge. And this really pisses Preston off to no end. So he writes this manifesto after his lodge basically um, secedes from the Grand Lodge because of this. And when he sends this manifesto out to everybody, again, a huge political mistake. And then the Grand Lodge basically says, you kidding? You're out. No more whack Arnold's for you. And they kick him out of the Grand Lodge again. 
And um, at this point, he continues to operate his Lodge of Antiquity and not admit Norfolk, uh, Northrop or anybody else that was a part of that. Totally irregular. Totally clandestine. At this yeah, point. they are operating a clandestine lodge. Never give up lodge property. Don't do anything. And so then what happens is uh, Northrop ends up having to create another lodge of antiquity and they operate. Um, and then basically Preston resigns for like a year. And then after the year, his buddies are like, hey, you got to come back and help us again um, to revive the lodge. And this all happens like they they kick him out. It's a real love-hate relationship because the dude was literally probably the best thing to happen to Freemasonry then. Um, he's, you know, we'll get into it, but he's largely responsible for making it cerebral. You know, I mean, a, a thinking man's game. Um, and uh, this was huge. And but you know he was very arrogant in his in his ways. Um, I think part of his lodge of antiquity stance is that uh, in his legend of the craft, uh, he basically um, attributes uh, the the craft coming. He starts his legend kind of when Adelstan comes into England, and he says that there was a grand lodge like in nine hundred. AD or something along those lines. I think 900 or 960, somewhere in there, uh, CE. And so he says that that's where his allegiance lies, like way back then. And this is, this is the antiquity or whatever. And they're like, and he called, in fact, he, he references the, the, the formation of Grand Lodge in 1717. He references as uh, a resurrection of Freemasonry because he, he doesn't recognize, you know, the Grand Lodge formation um, as being, you know, the first. He, he says that there were other Grand Lodges before. Uh, interesting guy. Um, one of the biggest problems, like, again, that we find with all of these guys and their histories of masonry and their constitutions and all this stuff is that um, they don't cite any sources. They just speak it right i mean uh, there's 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 no difference between their legend of the origins of the craft and the flying spaghetti monster i mean it's just because i said so uh and and so when we when you read any of preston's you know his origins like that it's something to remember as well as anderson they both are biz bizarrely you know but what what i find fascinating about that is i've learned a lot about how you do things like exegesis of these writings, meaning you have yeah. to decompose. Okay, if we can't directly find out what his sources are, we have to compare what was written in the syntax and the language and the phrases and see if there are other writings around that time frame that influenced, right? That you can directly trace. You know, this phrase is exactly the same phrase as what's going on in this other part that he would, would have been exposed to. And so you can kind of decompose it that way. So I think that's that's fascinating about how um, you know we know where he's embellished and where he's been influenced. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on when we get to the ritual part as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, so to really summarize, then he's kind of taken over by his own ego, but does a great contribution to the lectures of his craft, and um, it, it, he really becomes a. a a celebrity. I mean, there are there are people that join lodges just because he's either going to be there or he's a member there, <clears throat> and um, he has his own, uh, as we would call them today, ritual schools, and <clears throat> charges people to come in and you know selling copies of his his, his lectures. So he's he's obviously a big deal. Um, after everything kind of gets rectified, he um, he lives out his life, and uh, what I found fascinating too is up to the previous five years to his death, he, he has an illness and he's kind of out of the public eye. But one thing that is, is nice is that as part of his um, a donation after he dies, he wants a, a fund set up for a, um, a piece of Masonic education. I think that's really kind of cool. And we know that today as the Prestonian lecturer or lecturer for 
specifically the Quattro Coronati Lodge. And um, so if you Google Prestonian Lecture, or maybe we'll find a way to add that to the show notes, uh, every year Quattro Coronati Lodge has been taking on this um, this uh, endeavor to take these funds that have been you know generating um, interest and and help sponsor a Prestonian lecturer for that year. Uh, I think last year, the year before, was Rick Berman, and I uh, had the pleasure of meeting him as he kept, traveled over to the States, and he was the six, 2016 Pre Prestonian lecturer, gave a great talk on the foundations of UGLE um, masonry, and it's just a fascinating program that they have, all because of Preston's um, uh, donation to the craft after he died. I think that's pretty neat. Do you think uh, it would be possible for a mason today to rewrite the lectures uh to then i mean essentially do what he did go around and hold uh masonic schools and charge money and people go to them do you think no. do you think that could happen today without grand lodges basically calling them clandestine and um, just basically cutting off everything that is by far one of the easiest ways to get yourself expelled. <laughs> I mean, I think Preston got expelled for it. So, um, you know, not much has changed in that regard. Um, but I think, you know, as, as Masons today, we're so hamstrung and, and bound by this idea and this paranoia of regularity that anything we, we deem as irregular or clandestine, you know, automatically becomes a pariah. Um, yeah. I think, you know, given that, that paranoia regarding, you know, non-regularity, I, I think, you know, any, any venture would just be snuffed out. Yeah. I often think of terms of irregularity or, uh, clandestine masonry, uh, in terms of, um, you know, any kind of subject where we broach it, right. It, it's like, I feel like it's. I'm a settler in the Americas and, you know, I maybe said the word witch and everybody's like, <gasps> kill him. You know, like you're not even, I mean, these guys today react with such hostility and like shut down. Like the second you mention anything, um, it's really kind of funny. And to, to think about I mean, in Freemasonry. What? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, to think about though, you know, Preston, keeps a lodge going and they all know they're clandestine <laughs> they don't care you have to have you know, a lot like of to do that the you know what do they say what do we say you know the 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 uh, the key is uh holding the key to to men's hearts right and it's like this dude must have had this <laughs> like a special power a superpower well think about the time he's living in i mean this is you know, near the height of the ancients versus modern like schism. So the, the idea of supreme authority is, you know, regardless of which grand lodge you fall under, like you've got 50% roughly of, of your Masonic brethren uh, who think that your own grand lodge has, has no right to rule. And no authority. Um, so I think I think what is and is not regular was frankly uh, less of a big deal back then because there was um, very very you know little uh, legitimacy being exercised by other Grand Lodge because they were just warring against each other. You know, it's a really good point too because the more I read about the uh, Freemasonry in the colonies, holy smokes! Like every Grand Lodge was was all mixed around in the colonies. And we're, you know, chartering lodges in other states. And it was just this big melting pot of Freemasonry. It was insane. And and I'm surprised it all came yeah. together because they were like, you know, it just, it, it was amazing that the system survived with all these uh, political battles that were going on. Mm -hmm. Mike, you were getting ready to chime in and say something. Yeah. How dare he charge money to mentor yeah. those brothers, though? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one I've heard big time, you know. <laughs> so familiar. I, I don't know why that's so familiar. Yeah. Now, here's, the, here's the question, though. I Because I, 
you know, I do understand your point, RJ, that like Grand Lodges would just jump in and like shut them down, burn them, hang them. But considering how, oh, do I still have a mic problem? Darn it. Is this any better? Is it no spicy? Well, forget it. I don't want to talk. <laughs> You're too spicy for that mic, Juan. I'm too spicy. <laughs> hey, we'll let you we'll let you tinker with that while we switch over to Ham. Ham, you. Yeah. So I mean, you know, uh, a few years ago, well, two years ago, I, I I dealt with a lot of hearing this stuff. You know, I mean. Uh, you know, not to take any of your thunder, Juan, but I'll use your applied Freemasonry to talk about this because we did hear a lot about that. You know, um, guys asking, you're charging money to do this and do that. And it's like, well, no, it's really not, you know, we're not taking anything. We're just using it to pay for services, you know. And even that's probably all really um, uh, Preston was really, paying for was you know the publishing of the book and you know and the space that brings up a really good point Uh, they were the grand lodge was trying to find a way to kind of throw the book at him and they found that although he you know he was charging at um for the lodges of instruction or these ritual lodges uh, schools of instruction they really he really wasn't making anything on the books so yeah it was it was a, a not a good cause for them to try and and um at least accuse him of that that part of the witch hunt mm-hmm. is this any better just taking a chance drop out drop back in see. Was a good show <laughs> while he comes back uh let's start wrapping things back up because we really haven't talked about what his contribution to masonry has been and um again we talked a little bit about the influence of calcutt but it was really kind of pieced together, which obviously he found some deficiencies in. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the different sections of the different degrees that if you're a Mason and you've gone through these degrees, you'll recognize today that have been directly reworded and rewritten by Preston. And then next week we'll talk about how Webb has, has maybe made some modifications to that as well. But starting with the first degree, the uh, entered apprentice degree. Remember, this is the oldest degree, um, it was uh, when Preston was born in 1742. We really don't have any evidence yet of the Master Mason degree existing until like the 1750s. So um, the EA degree is kind of the oldest degree going on at this this point in time. So now he didn't change much of that. Um, he modified part of the Entered Apprentice charge and anything related to brotherly love, relief, and truth. He definitely uh, had a direct contribution to that as we know it today moving on to the fellow craft degree he's pretty much primarily responsible for all of the middle chamber lecture um, where he talks about the difference between operative and speculative masonry architecture and the five orders Um, he wrote that piece but was influenced by some of these older architectural texts specifically of vitruvian um, that's had a lot of you know esoteric architecture influence as well. So a question there, John. In different jurisdictions, you know, like here in Illinois, we have the senior deacons lecture and the middle chamber lecture. So for us, it's a little bit different. Um, our senior deacons lecture is largely where we see Preston's work here. Uh, and this is the explanation of 357, all this uh, architectural stuff. That's one and the same for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, The latter half of that lecture has heavy reference to Finch. Uh, But there's some, well, not heavy, but it's in there. It's pretty good. Interesting. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you more offline about that. Um, But he does. He does get into a direct contribution of the five senses, seven liberal arts and sciences. Uh, the particular description of globes, as well as the uh, brief uh, lecture on geometry. So things that are very familiar as, as we know them today, uh, he's he, he has a direct hand in write, writing or rewriting those. I uh, also I, I was ask I just want to ask you because maybe you know um, that this is like as far as I know and what I've heard is the first iteration of. Well, 
the first time globes are really like in the lectures at all. Um, and I've heard, you know, that this is due to re I mean, like somehow the globe is a newer thing and it's injected in there as a, is a piece of learning, uh, like a, like a learning tool. But I suspect that it's, that's not exactly true. Have you heard anything about that? I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just curious. I do not know. Okay. So, you know, who probably does know is like a hundred of the listeners out there. So shoot me an email. I know that. Um, of the spheres, Preston wrote, quote, their principal use besides strumming as maps to distinguish the outward parts of the earth and situation of the fixed stars is to illustrate and explain the phenomena arising from the an annual revolution and the diurnal rotation of the earth around its own axis. They are the noblest instruments for giving us the most distinct ideas of any problem or proposition, as well as enabling us to solve it. Contemplating these bodies, we are inspired with a due diligence and attention to astronomy, geography, navigation, and all the arts depended upon them by which society has been so much benefit. He finished up by writing the Fellowcraft charge as well as the Master Mason's charge and closing charge of the lodge you know, around, around the sacred altar. In addition, he wrote a lot more about the forms and customs and ceremonies of Masonry to include the lodge officer installation, uh, specifically the questions asked of the master, which if you've not heard, um, I highly encourage you to go look in one of our back episodes and see Jason Richards' uh, installation um, as master of his lodge. We have that shared on our, our website. And for those of you who aren't uh, <clears throat> doing anything Saturday morning, uh, I will be live streaming Acacia's next installation of officers, uh, probably using the, the TMR. Oh, cool. Uh, face or the TMR YouTube page as well. Awesome. Yeah. Pay close attention to Preston's work uh, as the questions are asked of the master before he assumes his duties, the jewels as an, and how they're explained for each officer and the charges given to each officer, uh, which is, you know, that's basically 90% of the uh, lodge officer installation uh, ceremony. Very much a, a Prestonian invention. And finally, the last piece of research I was able to find is that um, the public cornerstone laying ceremonies for public buildings um, was also his work as well. So as you can tell, um, for, for a guy who really got into masonry in the 1760s, uh, gave a tremendous amount of work and influence to Freemasonry as we know it. And uh, still recognized today as you read through. So I highly encourage all of you to go back and uh, listen to those different pieces of the lectures and portions of the degrees, as well as to find um, his illustrations of masonry and uh, another thing that I couldn't find online anywhere, which was uh, Preston's syllabus, which is really his penultimate compendium of all of these um, ritual publications. And that's what I got. So, given the lateness of the hour and not much on social media, let's go ahead and start to wrap things up. Starting with Mike the intern. Glad you made it home safe. Thank you. Join us. Uh, I, we've done a lot of rambling here while we're getting established, but is there anything you'd like to add and final thoughts? Um, you know, I, I read a little bit. I was actually able to get into the book some today and, you know, I was impressed with the the rate at which he actually made himself known, you know. Granted, it's the time period, but, man, he, he really did make himself known very fast. And uh, uh, I, I don't want to say popular because that's not quite the right word I'm looking for, but he did. I mean, he but he was doing such good work that uh, even though some, obviously, there were plenty of naysayers and that, uh, he turned it around and uh, he uh, sold it well and so well that we're still, I mean, honestly, that impresses me that we're still using it today. Thank you very much, Mike. Mm -hmm. 
and we'll see you next week. It's Robert Johnson. Yeah. So I think my, my biggest takeaway from all of this is probably um, go ahead and rewrite the ritual. Just kidding. <laughs> Could you imagine uh, everybody would poop their pants? I'm not kidding, but really seriously rewrite the ritual. <laughs> There are some areas within that ritual that probably need to be rewritten, uh, if if nothing else, uh, because the contextual meaning has changed dramatically. And you are saying things that you have no idea what that meant in the time it was written. It is a completely different meaning. And I only know a few instances that I've studied myself. Um, and this is because a friend of mine brought it up. Um, so I guess what I took away from researching Preston is that uh, no matter what you do in Freemasonry, you're, you're never going to get in as much trouble as he did. So go for it. Uh, write a book, write a cool lecture, uh, deliver it sometime to a lodge as, you know, extra education or whatever. Maybe it'll catch on and maybe in 80 years it'll be used. Um, I just think that it's, it's an inspiring story in terms of the times he lived and what he did. But again, uh, going back to that political climate where you had two lodges, I almost wonder, you know, did he think to himself, eh, if moderns don't like me, I'll just go to the ancients. If the ancients don't like me, yeah, I'll go back to the moderns. Um, the dude was so well known. It was like, what are you going to do? Kick me out? Oh, they kicked me out. I'll form my own Grand Lodge. <laughs> <Or Blackjack. laughs> yeah. Uh, and so he did. <laughs> but really cool. Um, fascinating dude. Uh, so if you can, you know, research it. Uh, there's some good history out there. Um, Mackey's Illustrated Guide has, uh, I, don't know, I, think, I think his name shows up three times in Prestonian Lectures, Preston, uh, William Preston, a biography, which is not really, there's not much there, but um, there's some decent stuff. Uh, particularly involved with his account of the legend of the craft and how it came into England. So his origins of uh, is pretty interesting. So uh, check that out. Um, John recommended uh, the book Mason's Word, uh, Words. Uh, just got it today. He's holding it up. Really good. Uh, I've only read you know a few pages, uh, and, and it's great. So check that out. Um, other than that, if you like Masonic Podcasts, 9.30 Sunday nights, Whence Came You, and I think on my release schedule right now for uh, Masonic Curators is Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, they're short five-minute videos. Check those out. If you've got something that you want to showcase, uh, go to curators.wcypodcast.com, read the submission guidelines, and do it. And then uh, send it over, and we'll get it up, and we'll put it out there for everybody to check out your cool item and its story. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let's head over to Jason. For his final thoughts all right so uh yeah just have to uh again plug uh bob davis's mason's words this is a fantastic book uh if you have heard of my um lecture on the noachite origins of the masonic third degree uh brother bob actually um uh, dedicates uh, you know a number of pages uh, to this this other phantom third degree that I talk about in depth. So uh, it's a treasure trove of, of knowledge, and um, it's much more interesting of a book than you would expect a book on the history of ritual to be. Uh, it's just really, really well done. It's very interesting, and it, it captured my attention very, very well throughout the entire book. Preston was a, was a visionary. When it comes down to it, uh, he's very much, he and Webb are very much the authors of our initiatic experience. And it's, we we owe both Preston and Webb uh, quite a great deal uh, as Masons today. Um, yeah, there were some ego issues, and, and we say ego in Freemasonry? 
no, 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 never. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I dare say, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, talk in masonry today about how we need to guard against innovations and, uh, yeah, you can't innovate, blah, 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 blah. You know, it has to stay the same. And I really feel like masonry was, was built on innovation and some of the best things to come out of masonry have been because of innovations. The third degree was the original innovation in masonry. It didn't exist prior to 1730. Um, you know, masonry as, as, you know, Mike has mentioned is a progressive science and it's not meant to stay static. Um, because when we stay static, we, we become less relevant and, and more outdated. Um, so, you know, if, if you've got ways to, um, make masonry better, I would, I would say, you know, go and, and try to do your best to, to actually have those things come to, to fruition. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about rewriting all the degrees, uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're living in an unparalleled age of information, access to information and, and ability to, to disseminate that information uh, further and quicker than we ever have before. And masonry is ripe to glean the benefits from from that technological and intellectual innovation um so let's let's reclaim the the intellectualism of freemasonry uh, because i i think that's where freemasonry needs to go next with the preponderance of uh of information today can you Get say off. that again can you say the title of that reclaim the what Reclaim the intellectualism of Freemasonry. You should write an extended PowerPoint book. <laughs> oh, well, well you yeah. know, one, one, one could say that the intellect is also part of the soul. I mean, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for like ruining my King speech moment there, Robert. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I live to serve, baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, rah rah, go do good things. Knowledge is awesome. Education's great. Back to you, John. Knowing is half the battle. Go, Joe. GI Joe. Let's see. So yeah, William Preston, interesting guy. Um, one, th one thing I think that uh, was really fascinating is again he didn't take no for an answer. He knew his stuff. Uh, he became zealous in the fraternity, as we all should. And um, he he definitely used the line about you know masonry being a progressive science as his justification to go forward, and that you know, these are these are things that need to be fixed. And he's definitely improved masonry for the better. So uh, very fascinating episode. Uh, a lot of research, really cool stuff. So hope you enjoyed it. That's all I got. Thanks for watching, and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.